Welcome to the third season of the Stronger Than Autoimmune podcast. Shout out to all the supporters out there. If you're new to the podcast, here's what it's about. As an autoimmune warrior myself, I understand living with autoimmunity isn't easy. You're not alone. This podcast is made to give hope to living with chronic illness. I will interview individuals living with autoimmune disease along with businesses and experts to provide knowledge and hope. As a health coach, I understand there is no cure for autoimmune disease, but creating lifestyle changes can influence how we feel. So if you haven't already, support the podcast. There are three ways. One, share it. Two, review through Apple. Three, rate it through Spotify. So join me on being stronger than autoimmune. And enough of this intro. Let's get to the interview. Thank you so much for joining me on the Stronger Than Autoimmune podcast, Dr. Nishi Bhopal. She is a board-certified psychiatry, sleep medicine, and integrative holistic medicine physician. She is the founder and medical director of Pacific Integrative Psychiatry and online practice in California, where patients receive a whole-person approach to anxiety, depression, sleep disorders, including getting nutrition and psychotherapy with integrative and functional medicine. So thank you for joining me on the Stronger the Autoimmune podcast, Dr. Nishi oh, Paul. Thank you. You can call me Nishi. Thank you so much thank for you. having me on. Yeah, yeah. I understand that you create this interbalance of functional medicine and traditional medicine and before we get into this, because I think it's very important that we don't take this one-sided approach with anything, that it's really a mix of a bag of tricks, I guess you can say. But I want to find out where are you connecting from? Yeah. So, well, I'm um, based in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, although our uh, practice, Pacific Integrative Psychiatry, is virtual. So we see patients all across California. But yeah, I'm, I'm based here in the, in the SF area. Nice. Nice. And on your website, you mentioned that you are from Canada and you came from this, you know, Punjabi, I can't, how, how Punjabi. Do you say? Punjabi <laughs> family. And how did living in Canada, coming from this very culture background, influence the way you practice medicine or are you becoming a doctor? Yeah, it's it's such an interesting question. So um, to put it into context, so I, I was born in Canada. That's where I grew up on the west coast of Canada in Vancouver, BC. And yeah, so my, my family originally came from India, from the state of Punjab, which is in the north of India. And I think for anyone who grew up as a child of um, immigrants, whether you were, you know, a first or second generation immigrant or, or further along, um, it's an interesting experience, right? Because you're kind of bicultural. You're growing up between two or more different cultures, depending on your background. And so for me personally, um, there was a feeling of never quite fitting into one or the other fully, right? Like never fully feeling, I mean, I, I am Canadian and I, I feel Canadian, but never fully being perceived as that, and I think times have changed now. I'm probably dating myself a little bit here, but back when I was growing up, the default was white, right? So, as a person of color, feeling never fully accepted and being asked questions like, Do you speak English? Where are you from? No, where are you really from? You know, dealing with those kinds of things. So, feeling like you never fully belong. And then on the other side, um, having this Indian background, traveling to India, being told, well, you're not really Indian, like you're Canadian, you're, you're not from here, right? So there's this interesting kind of dynamic of, well, what am I? Where do I fit in? And so I think for me, that led to a lot of adaptability and flexibility. Um, you know, so it, I was really open to moving and traveling, and it kind of led me to study medicine abroad. Um, I ended up going to Ireland to study medicine. And, you know, I'm here in the US now. I never imagined that I would be living here. So I think there was a, a level of resilience and flexibility that came with that. And then from the medical standpoint, um, you know, I was often exposed to ideas of like yoga and 
meditation and spirituality and even homeopathy. Um, my uh, grandfather was really interested in homeopathic medicine. And I didn't really take that into account much when I was younger, right? I was like, okay, whatever. You know, I didn't really pay attention to it very much. But now as I've progressed in my career and I'm in this kind of integrative world, um, I can see how those were planting little seeds of interest in me uh, with regards to my personal interest in, interest in yoga and meditation and then um, my professional interest in integrative medicine. Yeah, what a way of taking this uncomfortable feeling and transitioning it to a resilience mindset and make it in your own. Because, I mean, could have anybody in those situations can easily create a feeling of, I guess, victim or poor me or I'm, I just don't belong, but you created it into, okay, I could take both of these worlds and make it my own. And it seems like that's what you're doing with your practice right now is getting bits and pieces that have created you into you and helping others find their own way. And with that being said, how do you take each of these psychiatry, sleep medicine, holistic medicine, and bring it into what you're doing today? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's a really natural intersection between those different specialties, right? And, and so like when I was doing my psychiatry training, well, I actually started out doing internal medicine um, when I was a resident after medical school. And then I, I noticed that I was just talking to my patients about their lives and what was going on and what's happening in your relationships and how are these dynamics affecting your health? And then I realized that, oh, wait a minute, I probably chose the wrong specialty. Maybe I should have done psychiatry, um, which was always an interest of mine. I just didn't choose it right out the gate. And so ended up switching into psychiatry. And when I was in my psychiatry residency, I noticed that so many of our patients were struggling with sleep. And I didn't feel like we were really getting a lot of education on sleep. And most doctors only get about two hours of education on sleep during medical school. But every single patient has to sleep, right? So I could see the impact it was having on my patients, but also on myself, just personally. Um, being someone who's always struggled with feeling tired, fatigued, sleepy, um, feeling sleepier than my peers. Um, I could relate to some of my, what my patients were struggling with, too, with regards to fatigue and, and those kinds of issues. And so that's where I got interested in sleep medicine. Um, and I didn't even know that that was a thing you could study um, until one of my senior residents was going into a sleep medicine fellowship training program and told me about that. And I was like, what? Like, that's a thing? You can do that? And so... <laughs> <laughs> I, I had no idea. Now it's much more popular, but back then it wasn't really a thing that um, was very common to study. So um, she introduced me to that idea. So I started exploring that whole world of, of sleep medicine and where I did my residency training at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan. Um, they have a great sleep medicine program there. So I started doing some rotations and stuff with them. And all along the way, I was struggling with my own fatigue, like I was saying, my own anxiety and burnout. Um, and that's when I started to learn more about integrative medicine, yoga, meditation, just for personal reasons. And it helped me so much to the point where I was like, why are we not using this in conventional medicine like why are we not talking about these things or if we are talking about them and it's a, it's in a very small almost like superficial kind of way um like recommending diet and exercise and that's about it um but there's no deeper guidance on those things so um yeah so that kind of sparked this internal journey as well and so those things kind of combined and i i had this vision of one day having a, a practice or a clinic where patients could experience all of these things. They could get help with a whole body approach to mental health, which is what we offer now. But that that little um, 
you know, that seed again was planted during that time. Um, and it largely came out of my own personal experiences. Yeah. Yeah. And since you had your own personal experience with sleep and with fatigue and anxiety, how did you, I mean, who did you, did you, I mean, back then, I don't think, I don't know if Google was around or did you go to the library? How did you learn <laughs> how to integrate these other methods into your own personal life? Yeah. So, um, well, I actually was introduced to yoga in a more structured way through my now husband. So we were dating at the time. And um, like I'd been to yoga classes at the gym and, you know, like done that kind of stuff or, you know, done a meditation class at the gym or whatnot, but had never really done it in a more serious, not really serious, but like more um, structured way. And, and so I was dating my um, now husband and he had actually just come out of a three month silent meditation retreat. Oh, wow. <laughs> so like I met him shortly after a few months after he completed that 90 day program, which was completely in silence for, for that amount of time. And he was quite dedicated to his yoga practice that um, he had learned. And he was just every day doing this meditation practice. And I got really curious about that and asked him, well, what is that? Like, what are you, what are you doing? Like he would do it right on the dot, you know, like it's six o'clock and we're, I think, you know, we should be sitting down and have dinner or whatever. And he's like, nope, got to go do my, my meditation. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so I'm like, okay, well, there must be something to this, right? If he's, he'd be so dedicated to it. Um, so that just piqued my curiosity about, well, what is this all about? And so he introduced me to this program called Inner Engineering. Um, which uh, is still around uh, for anyone who's kind of interested in getting into meditation and learning what it what, what it's all about. That was just really a life changing program for me personally. Awesome. Um, so I was Thank living, you. yeah, and I was living in Detroit. I came to San Francisco actually at the time. That's where the program was, and that's how I got started with it. And then to integrate these things into my medical practice. Um, you know, I did a lot of studying after that. So I took classes in Ayurveda, in integrative psychiatry, integrative medicine. And um, yeah, and have been finding ways to kind of sprinkle that into my work since then. Mm. So I'm wondering how, but after you started practicing, how long did it take for you to feel these results of feeling more lighter and reduced anxiety and better sleep? Yeah, it's such an interesting question. So um, the practice that I learned to do, um, you're supposed to do it for a certain amount, like, a, you know, about 40 days or so um, to kind of, you know, get into the habit of it and get it into your system. And I did find within that amount of time, so within about a month, I really started to notice the difference. Um, and it was a very subtle change for me. Um, I know everyone's personal experience will be different, but for me, it was a very subtle change, right? So, like, I just noticed that, like, oh, I'm a little calmer. I feel less stressed out by by things that might have bothered me before. Um, I feel a little bit more rested. Um, I feel like I'm sleeping a little bit more deeply. Um, things like that. Or I, I feel like there's more mental clarity. I can make decisions more easily, right? So those kinds of things. And then those persisted over time. Um, so for anyone who's getting started, who's thinking about it, um, I do recommend having some kind of guidance because it's, it's really hard to sit down and say, okay, I'm going to meditate. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to clear my mind. Like it doesn't work that way. Right? It's very hard <laughs> no. to do it that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Having, having somebody kind of hold her hand or, you know, having, like you said, inner, inner experience, you said. Get to give you some type of daily what you're doing right, what you know, don't give up. Or, I mean, I know for me, some days I could really hone in and feel really great, and other days, not so much. But I know I don't give up and I keep on saying, okay, I'll just try again. And but it is a constant 
training. It's like training of the brain, as you can say. But any other tips besides having somebody to guide you on this journey? Like, I know for you, you probably had the experience of some days are really good, sometimes you're really bad. That's why I mentioned that. How do you keep moving forward with the practice? Yeah. Oh, that's, I'm so glad you brought that up. That's such a great point. And it can be a stuck point for people, right? That's where people can get frustrated that I'm doing this practice, I'm doing my meditation, and my mind is still racing, or I still feel anxious. Um, This isn't working. I'm not doing it right. Right? Those kinds of um thoughts are so common. And I hear that all the time from patients in our practice, like, I can't meditate. I don't know how it doesn't work for me. And so what I encourage people is that there's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, like you're not doing it wrong or it's not that you're not capable of doing it. We all have these experiences. And so me personally, like this practice that I um, learned, I learned that in 2011, right? <laughs> it's a long time ago. Um, and I still, this morning, I, you know, I, I did my, my practice and I noticed that my mind was a little bit more scattered, uh, a little bit more distracted. And that's okay. That's just part of it. And as you said, it is training your brain. It's training your energy system. And every day is going to be different. And so the mindset I go that I go into it um, with every day is that it's almost like it's the first time I'm doing it. Letting go of any expectation of this is how it should be. This is what it should look like. This is what my experience should be. Because that is when you get in your own way. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I just try to, today's day one. Just think of it that way. And I'm, let me just see what happens today. I'm just going to do it, follow the instructions, follow the process, and whatever happens, happens. And that's okay. And I'm just going to keep going. Um, and just letting go of expectations and letting go of any um, expected outcome will actually help it work better. Yeah, letting go. And I think that is a huge thing with humans. It's hard to let go sometimes yes. the past, the future expectations of what we're supposed to do, not to do. I, I think because we're just trained that way ever since we we're little, you know, we go through school and there's these expectations. Our parents get expectations. We give our own selves expectations. So um, I'm, I'm curious with earlier, you mentioned this when you were describing meditation. So what do you mean by energy systems? Yeah, so um, this is where we kind of go into the metaphysical <laughs> aspects, right? <laughs> so you know we have we have a physical body, right? We've got emotions, um, but we also have an energy system um, that kind of affects how we go through the world. It affects how we feel, and I mean, just very simply put, you can think about it when you know when you meet someone and you feel like. Oh, I, I didn't like their energy. Or you go into a room and you feel like the energy is off in here, right? We have that intuitive sense. So meditation can be a way to help regulate your own energy system, right? To help you get into alignment. And in Ayurveda, which is the traditional system of healing from India, that's about, you know, over 5,000 years old, there's this concept called Ojas. Um, it's O-J-A-S. And um, essentially, it it means a circle. It's kind of like the lubrication of life. Like the more um, aligned you are with your energy system and with kind of what's happening in the universe, the more your life is lubricated, the easier mm-hmm. you go through life with more ease. It doesn't mean that bad things aren't going to happen or that you're not going to have challenges or obstacles. Those things will happen anyway. Those are inevitable. But it's about creating yourself in such a way that you can navigate those things with a little bit more ease right and so part of that is the the mental aspect the physical aspect and then this energy aspect Mm, thank you for answering and that seems to go along with sleep i mean if you're all whacked out and out of balance then you obviously can't sleep well And I would see that same thing with psychiatry, that it just kind of blends in. So how do these intersect? How do you 
bring all these things together. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, this is my favorite topic, (laughs) (laughs) as you know. So sleep and mental health have a bi-directional relationship. So what that means is that when you're, when a person is struggling with sleep, it's going to impact their mental health and vice versa. When a person is struggling with mental health, whether it's anxiety, depression, burnout, or other uh, PTSD, trauma, it's going to affect their sleep, right? So the two things go hand in hand. Um, So if you're dealing with one, you also need to address the other. Um, So just to give you some statistics, like 80% of people with anxiety have trouble falling asleep. Um, And then when people have sleep issues, it doubles their risk of developing anxiety. Right. So that relationship goes both ways. Now, people often think about sleep as this passive process, right? Like you go to sleep and then you're out cold (laughs) for eight hours and then you wake up and you're (laughs) done. Right. But there is so much that happens during sleep that is restorative to the body and the brain. It's actually a very active process that we need to make sure we give time and space for that to happen. So what happens during sleep is that the brain is able to clear out toxins and proteins that build up during the day. So the longer we're awake, the more we build up these like metabolites and toxins and things that um, are just a natural byproduct of our metabolism. Um, When we sleep, it gives the brain the opportunity to clear that stuff out through the glymphatic system. And this happens primarily during deep sleep. So it clears out amyloid proteins and things like this um, that are implicated in cognitive decline and dementia later in life. So that's one thing that happens. We also get consolidation of memories. Um, And this happens primarily during REM sleep, but in other aspects too. And it's important for emotional memories as well, because what can happen is when people are sleep deprived, um, studies show that people tend to think more about negative. It's harder to filter out negative thoughts and negative memories. Mm, okay. But when we sleep, it's almost like there's a filing cabinet and then our brain is able to like file things away. Like, okay, this is important. That's not important. Um, this goes, okay, let's just put this in the, in the back of the cabinet. We don't really need that right now. Um, so it kind of makes sense of all the stimuli and experiences that we're exposed to every day so that we mm-hmm. can have more clarity and um, more emotional regulation around those things as well. So, I mean, you can just imagine the person, you know, we've all had this experience where we haven't gotten enough sleep and we're irritable and we're cranky and snapping at our partner, right? <laughs> and, and so, um, you know, getting enough sleep is also helpful for emotional regulation in that sense. And then, I mean, there's so many more benefits to sleep, so many things that happen. Um, uh, we also can learn physical tasks during sleep. So if you're working on your tennis swing or you're uh, learning to ride a bike or a motorcycle or something like this, um, your brain is able to record those motor memories during sleep. So it's easier for you to to learn that skill. And then metabolism is affected as well. Um, So we get regulation of our blood sugars, um, our hunger hormones, leptin and ghrelin, um are affected as well so that's why when when we're sleep deprived or we haven't gotten good quality sleep we might crave um more comfort foods you know grab you might want to grab that bag of chips or those cookies in the afternoon so the list goes on there's so many benefits to sleep and so many impacts on different aspects of our health yeah thank you for explaining the emotional regulation that it almost needs to be filed it it, it seems like sleep is those underutilized part of life that people strive to say, oh, I only had four hours of sleep and two hours of sleep. And that's, I mean, that that, that happens to you when you're going through medical school. I mean, they, they keep you up for so long, yes. which it kind of like, it's kind of strange. Like, do I really want somebody taking care of me or... <laughs> Right? <laughs> only had two hours of sleep. <laughs> but it sounds like you really got the before and after, like what really works, what doesn't, you know, how do you really feel? And I know you mentioned if you don't get enough sleep or what helps you sleep, but I'm very curious, like what if you're one of these people that wakes up in the middle of the night? I've heard that if you wake up at the middle of the night between certain hours, it 
you have like your liver does certain things at some time at one to three and your, I don't know, stomach does something else between four and five. I mean, is that really true or how does, how does that work? Yeah, it's, it's such a common thing waking up in the middle of the night. Um, so to break it down, the first thing to know is that it's normal to wake up during the night. Um, you know, I know a lot of patients and people that I work with um, have this idea, and I think it's kind of been hammered into us that we need eight hours of continuous sleep for it to be healthy. And that's simply not the case. Like when you look at normal sleep, it's actually totally normal to have little awakenings after each sleep cycle. And each sleep cycle is about 90 minutes to two hours. Um, and then it's very common to have these awakenings around two or three in the morning. Um, they only become problematic if it's harder to get if it's hard to get back to sleep. So if someone wakes up and then they go back to sleep within a few minutes or so, that's fine, totally normal. I wouldn't be concerned about that. Maybe they get up and they go use the washroom or something, then they go back to bed and fall back asleep. Totally fine. Um, but if they're having prolonged awakenings or it's happening um, repeatedly throughout the night where it's like really disruptive, then we want to look at other causes. So when I think about the causes, I break those down into, is it a circadian rhythm thing? So body clock. Does it have to do with their sleep drive? So we all have this sleep drive that the longer we're awake, the more we um, build up this neurotransmitter called adenosine that makes us sleepy. Um, and sometimes people have issues with their sleep drive, maybe um, because they're spending too much time in bed or they're taking long naps or they're drinking caffeine too late in the day, which blocks adenosine. Um, so is it a sleep drive issue? Then the third thing I look at is hyperarousal. So is their nervous system um, dysregulated or hyperactive? And that could be due to a whole bunch of different things. It could be due to anxiety, depression, worrying, stress, you know, maybe you're worrying about your finances or your kids or family or whatever, right? So uh, traumas, maybe you're thinking about things that have happened. Um, so it could be related to that. It also could be related to uh, sleep disordered breathing or sleep apnea which is really important for people with autoimmune conditions because um, people with autoimmune issues do have a higher risk of sleep, a higher rate of sleep apnea. And then having sleep apnea untreated also increases the risk of developing an autoimmune condition. Mm. And it's, it's really under-recognized in women and autoimmune conditions are more common in women. And so this is something I just want everyone listening to think about because in women, sleep apnea can look like fatigue chronic pain, um, depression, uh, headaches, whereas in men, it usually shows up as loud snoring, um, right? And so like men are, are more likely to get a sleep study, but a woman will be told, oh, you have fibromyalgia or you have depression, when maybe it was sleep apnea that was disrupting her sleep uh, or causing fatigue. So I, I just wanted to hammer that point in. Um, no, thank yes. you for mentioning that. Yeah, I mean, because yeah. this is an autoimmune um, podcast. and. As you mentioned, we may not be snoring, but is there any, I mean, obviously a sleep study would help, but is there any other way of testing such, you know, sleep apnea in women other than a sleep study? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, a sleep study is really required to diagnose it. Um, but what people should know is that um, now there's home sleep studies, right, which makes it way more accessible and way easier for people to get um, a sleep study done. But they're not very sensitive. So they're more likely to pick up on sleep apnea in uh, someone with very um, classic symptoms of sleep apnea or who have more like moderate to severe sleep apnea. But for women, especially if they have more mild sleep apnea, their home sleep study might say, you don't have it. And then they're usually sent along their way. Sorry, you don't have sleep apnea. We don't know what else to do. I see this all the time. So what I recommend to people is if they have a home sleep test and it's negative, but you're still having a lot of fatigue or issues with sleep or other types of symptoms, then an in-lab sleep study would be the next step, um, which is a lot more um, sensitive. And so it can pick up on, on what's going on. and Sometimes people need more than one night of testing because it can mm. fluctuate from night to night. Um, so I really like to emphasize that to my patients, especially my female patients, 
um, that we work with in our practice that, um, hey, you know what, let's let's keep pursuing this. Let's not give up after one or two tests. Let's really try to get to the root of this and see what's going on. And for people that really don't know how, and thank you for explaining that, um, for people that don't know how sleep apnea works in your body, what does it do? I mean, can you explain that and why it's so important to get tested? Other than, you know, fatigue and pain. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. No, yeah, that's really, really important. So, um, well, what sleep apnea is, apnea means stopping of breathing. And so what happens is you get a collapse of the airway and then um, this obstruction of airflow. So you just don't get enough air. And then this can result in a drop in oxygen. So your brain isn't getting enough oxygen during the night. And so there's short-term side effects, of course, that can happen with that, like fatigue, trouble concentrating, um, mood issues. Uh, it can be dangerous. People can get fall asleep at the wheel, right, and get into car mm. accidents. I always think about this when I'm out driving, like, oh, my gosh, like, how many people have untreated sleep apnea out here that are <laughs> driving around sleep deprived? So, you know, so there's real public health consequences, too. But long term, it increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, cardiac arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, uh, increased risk of dementias like Alzheimer's disease, um, high blood pressure, increased risk of treatment resistant mood disorders like depression, and so on. And uh, increased risk of stroke as well it can make it um, harder to lose weight or can cause some dysregulation of metabolism, blood sugars, things like this. Um, and the other point, again, for women is that women, even when they have mild sleep apnea, they're at a higher risk of developing those long-term consequences than a male patient. Mm. So this is, again, why it's so important for women to be aware of this and to um, pursue evaluation if they think this might be going on. Thank you. And I know that you mentioned that there's a mental health aspect to chronic illness, and you see this a lot with your practice. Can you explain what's the cross section? Yeah, absolutely. So um, again, there's a bi-directional relationship between chronic illness or autoimmune il illness as well um, and mental health issues. Um, and there was a study out of the UK that showed that more than half of patients with autoimmune conditions experience a mental health condition as well, um, like depression or anxiety. Um, but also, of course, severe fatigue is a big one. And then cognitive dysfunction, so problems with concentration and memory, um, is another one. And in this study, they found that the majority of patients with these chronic illnesses aren't even asked about their mental health, mm. even though more than half of them have some kind of experience with uh, impact on their mental health. And there's different reasons for this. Um, some of it might be due to inflammation. Um, so there's widespread inflammation, of course, that can have mental health symptoms as well. But also, you know, I, I think about the psychological impact of having a chronic illness, especially an illness that's kind of invisible, right? When people look at you, they they think you're fine, right? Yeah. Um, and they don't see the impact this illness is having on you. And that can take a, a toll on you, on you personally. Um, in terms of like self-esteem, feeling a sense of connection, um, feeling that people don't understand, um, even feeling like people are um, expecting things out of you that you simply cannot do. Um, mm -hmm. And so that can really take a, a significant toll on, on a person's mental health. So there's lots of different aspects to it. And all these problems that with sleep and it affects women and mental health and how it affects women and autoimmune day. <laughs> and yes. it's amazing how we are able to hold all these and we still carry through. So I believe women are very strong and you were able to help many people find a way of finding their own health, but through integrative medicine. Can you explain how your approach with anxiety, depression, mental health, and sleep, how you 
uh, what your what your approach is with all this. Yeah. So, I mean, the way that I think about an integrative approach is that, like, integrative medicine is just good medicine, in my view, <laughs> right? It's just it's kind of like the old fashioned way of doing things in the sense that it's about listening to the person in front of you, just giving them space to share their story, um, collaborating with them, seeing where they are what's important to them, what are their values, um, where do they want to start, right? Of course, there might be areas where it's like, okay, there's something we really need to address first, but generally, okay, like, where do you want to start? How do you want to approach this? Um, working on lifestyle based on what that person is able to do, what resources they have accessible to them, um, what they enjoy, right? So not just about prescribing something to them, okay, go do this or take this pill. But it's it's really a it's a collaboration. It's a conversation, um, and so that's what we we offer to all of our patients who who come in. And we really like to be intentional about how we're approaching treatment with each individual who comes into our practice. And it starts with a a pretty extensive um, questionnaire. Like we have this mm-hmm. like long like questionnaire um, for people that goes into their. Um, all kinds of aspects of their daily lives. Um, and, you know, it's funny because patients often say, like, wait, this is a psychiatric practice. Why are you asking me about my poop? <laughs> you know, like, why are you asking me about my like, bowel movements and, like, <laughs> what I'm eating and all this stuff? But we want to know everything. We want to know everything. We just want to get a really good picture of what this person's life looks like. And that makes it easier for us to to work with them on a plan. And so that plan could include anything from medications. So some people come to us and say, you know what, I need help with medication. Okay, great. You know, they might be interested in in antidepressant or something. We can help them with that. But we can also offer um, nutrition coaching, um, working on their gut health, of course, working on their sleep, botanical supplements, um, uh, herbs, and other nutritional interventions like that. We do testing. Um, and again, it depends on the patient. Some some people will say, you know, if they, if they can't afford the testing or it's um, kind of not something they're interested in doing. And it's if it's not, um, you know, urgent, then, you know, we'll work with them on that. But it's we have all these tools at our disposal. And the art form is figuring out what tools are appropriate for mm. each patient. Yeah. So it's not a one you know, one size fits all type of medical care that you're giving. What tips or commonalities that you find working with autoimmune clients that seems to be like the first thing you would recommend they work on? Yeah, it's, that's, it's hard to answer because it is such a personalized thing. Um, so I'm thinking about, you know, some patients that we have um, where, you know, we'll, we'll get patients who come in who are like, just tell me what to do and I will do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. So, you know, great. Okay. Let's, we often will start with nutrition, um, nutrition and gut health and um, starting there because especially with autoimmune there may be some food sensitivities um, that could be contributing. Uh, so like I can, you know, for me personally, um, I, I don't have an autoimmune condition, but I, like I said, I do I've had this lifelong struggle with fatigue and um, brain fog and headaches and things like this. And what I figured out was that gluten was a big component of that. Um, and so just personally seeing how that was so impactful for me to, to be able to cut that out and make those changes. So anyway, so we'll work with patients on on that. Often we'll start with nutrition. But like I said, some patients aren't ready for that. And that's okay. Mm. Um, they might want to just start with medication for depression, or they might want to start with um, some supplements, or they might want to start with sleep. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a hard one to answer because it's so personalized. Yeah, yeah. And I know you work with um, a lot of different, like you said, you're coming from the aspect of Ayurvedic medicine. Any, and I read in your blog, there's certain uh, 
um, herbs that people are using and they're just taking it and using it, but it's not in the right aspect. Any ones you want to highlight that really you want to make sure people don't use or use? Yeah. So, um, there's so many herbs and botanicals and supplements out there on the market and you want to really be careful about drug interactions because some of these things can interact with medications. One that immediately comes to mind is rhodiola, um, which is a common one. It's a, it's a adaptogen or a botanical that helps regulate the nervous system. And it can be really helpful for people with fatigue. It can help with energy. Um, but it can interact with SSRI medications, which are commonly used for depression and anxiety. So your, you know, Zoloft, Prozac, Lexapro, those types of medications. Um, it doesn't mean you cannot take them together, but there can be interactions. And I've seen this happen with patients um, who are taking an SSRI and then they added in rhodiola for a supplement that contained that. And they started feeling more anxious or wired or irritable, like just a little bit overactivated. And they, were, they didn't know why. And then we kind of go back and look at what all they're taking. And then, um, you know, there, there could be that interaction and then removing that has, has helped alleviate the symptoms. So that's one that comes to mind right away. Um, so what I recommend to, to people is if you are going to be taking a supplement, um, check with your doctor to see if there are any drug interactions, if you're on prescription medications or some supplements can interact with each other too. Check with your doctor. If your doctor doesn't know, and unfortunately, many conventionally trained doctors who don't have this integrative background or lifestyle medicine background, they might not know um, that it might be worth consulting with someone who does. But there's also a great resource through Memorial Sloan Kettering, mm. um, which is the Cancer Center in New York. They've On their website, they have an About Herbs website um, page, and they have a section for patients and a section for healthcare practitioners. And you can look up almost any herb on there and it'll tell you the drug interactions. Oh, so wow. that's a, yeah, it's a really good resource both for patients and for practitioners. Um, but that's the number one thing I would look out for is those interactions. The other supplement that comes to mind that I see a lot of people taking that maybe isn't taken the right way is melatonin. Mm. Um, <laughs> that's a whole, <laughs> yeah. a whole podcast episode. Exactly. On itself, but <laughs> Yes. Um, and then the just the quick things with that, quality matters. Um, there was a study that came out, a couple of studies actually recently, showing that often with these melatonin supplements, what's on the label isn't actually what's in the pill or the tablet mm. itself. Um, it can range anywhere from like minus 70% to 400% of, of what was labeled, something like this. Um, so if you are going to be using melatonin, um, again, Make sure it's being used for the right reasons. I have some information on my YouTube channel about that. Um, make sure it's the right dosing. I often see people taking too high of a dose. Uh, generally, less is more. So I usually don't recommend more than like one or two milligrams, but usually I recommend in the range of 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 milligrams, depending on the person and what we're, you're using it for. Um, and then the amount of time sometimes... Um, Depending on the patient, for some people it can, might be helpful long term, but for others it might just be useful short term to get their body clock back on track. Um, so that's just kind of like a little quick summary on melatonin, but there's a lot more to unpack. Yeah, there. I'm <laughs> so sure. I'm so sure. And probably every time somebody says that word, you're like waiting to. <laughs> <laughs> Your eyes are just ready to twitch. Yes. Um, <laughs> And, and I don't mean to keep you too long. Um, I know there are some other questions on here that I sent you about if if you have time just to answer sure. omega threes and how it really yeah. helps with um, mental health. Yeah, definitely. So omega threes. So this is a great topic because um, omega threes are good for so many different kinds of things, like cardiovascular health, you know, brain health, mental health. Um, and how they specifically help with mental health is that, so omega-3s are fats, and our cell membranes are made up of fats and phospholipids. Um, and so they help the functionality, basically, of the cells um, in our body and the cells in our brain, and particularly um, in the brain with neurotransmission, so um, communication with serotonin and dopamine. So it, it just helps 
So again, using that word lubricate helps lubricate that whole system. Um, so the American Psychiatric Association recommends that people with mood disorders or impulse control disorders or psychotic disorders should take about a gram, one gram or a thousand milligrams of omega-3s per day. And like a combination of EPA and DHA. Uh, sometimes I get this question of what's the right ratio of EPA and DHA. And the short answer is um, it's not really known for mental health. There's been different studies looking at it. Some studies show that more EPA is better. Um, some studies show that DHA alone is not really that helpful for mental health. Um, so there's a con, you know, you want to look for a combination okay. of that. Um, but yes, yeah, so about a, a thousand milligrams per day is what the AP, uh, American Psychiatric Association recommends. Um, anything above three grams, you have to be careful with because it can influence blood clotting. Um, so for higher doses, it's, it's recommended to talk to your doctor to make sure that's safe for you to take. But generally, a, a gram or two grams is safe for most people. Okay, thank you. You mentioned with sleep, not to go backwards, but I kind of wanted to connect what you mentioned about, was that sleep drive? Not having enough sleep drive, you called it something. How does that work with exercise? I mean, is there a connection? Oh, and yes. How to connect yeah. that also with mental health too. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Such a that's such a great question. So um so activity increases the sleep drive. So if we think about you can think about sleep drive um also as sleep pressure. So it's the pressure like that feeling of, oh, I can't keep my eyes open, I'm nodding off. Um, that is partly related to your, you know, this largely related to your sleep drive at night. So the longer you're awake and the more active you are. Um, the more you build up this neurotransmitter called the denosine, that is what makes us feel sleepy. And so exercise fits into that. So if you're more active during the day, it is going to have a positive impact on your sleep um, and help increase that sleep drive so that you're more tired, essentially, simply put, right? So uh, you'll you'll have a higher sleep drive. Exercise, of course, is so good for your mental health. It's good for physical health. It's it's good for so many things, um, but very good for mental health. It's one of the best medicines that we have for mental health. Um, we want to think about it as a medicine. Um, and even being active for a short amount of time, so like 10 to 15 minute bursts, can have a positive impact. And so, again, for you know people who are struggling with fatigue or autoimmunity, we see with our patients, like they feel more tired after they exercise, um, especially here in California, people go for hikes and stuff, and then they're exhausted after mm -hmm. that. And then they're wiped out for like two days or three days after that. So it's a fine balance between being active, getting movement, but not pushing yourself to the point of exhaustion where you feel worse. So that's not going to be good for your mental health. Um, the WHO, the World Health Organization, and the CDC um, recommend at least 150 minutes per week of moderate to intense aerobic activity or um, 75 minutes of vigorous aerobic activity per week. Um, and then also strength training, muscle training on two or more days a week. Um, and I like to recommend, again, women's health recommendations. I like to recommend to all my female patients to do strength training. It's something that we often skip as women, um, but it's so important for us for um, just maintaining our strength, but also bone health as we age, keeping up the strength of our bones. But again, the regularity of exercise is important, making it easy for you, making it fun. It should be something you enjoy, not something you dread. <laughs> <laughs> um, and finding little ways to build it into your daily routines. Like what I do is I'm on Zoom a lot of the day. And so what I'll do is after each Zoom meeting, I'll get up and I'll do some squats um, or maybe like go up and down the stairs a couple of times, uh, go out midday, take my dog for a walk, those kinds of things. So it's kind of built in. So it doesn't feel like, oh my gosh, I have to go to the gym for an hour today that can feel kind of overwhelming so see if there's ways you can build in more movement yeah yeah and how do you know if it's like you said you know overdoing it um underdoing it how do you know if it's, if it's enough yeah i mean i would say just check in with how you feel do you do you feel like you need more movement your your body knows 
Mm. Right? Like there's so much wisdom in our bodies. And it's just about tuning into yourself, getting quiet, noticing how you feel. Um, I guess that's where and, the meditation comes in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that mindfulness. Yeah, absolutely. And then building strength over time, right? So if you've been exercising regularly, that's the goal is that you can do longer hikes or you can lift more weights over time. But don't push yourself to the point of injury or exhaustion. Um, yeah, it's just a lot of it is just tuning into yourself and, and noticing. Awesome. And thank you for answering these questions. Um, anything that you want to share with the audience that we did not cover with autoimmunity or chronic illness that you see a lot in your clinic? Mm. Yeah, I think mm, that's such a good question. I think just knowing that there's lots of things available to you, there's lots of things that you can do. Um, and this is the beauty of an integrative medicine or a lifestyle medicine approach. And if something doesn't feel right to you, it's okay. You know, there is no one size fits all um, treatment approach to autoimmunity. Everyone is so unique and so different. And allowing yourself to be authentic through that process of seeking care. If you're working with someone who you feel like isn't really listening to you or doesn't understand where you're coming from, it's okay to seek a second opinion to work with someone who does support you. And also to surround yourself with supportive people in your life. Um, I see this a lot with, with our patients who struggle with chronic illness or autoimmunity, sometimes patterns of people-pleasing, perfectionism, <laughs> codependency, lacking boundaries. These things can come up frequently. Um, so being mindful of that as well and just surrounding yourself with, with a supportive community is so important. Yeah. Thank you for the reminder of that because you could be doing all these things rather, you know, taking omega threes, exercising, sleeping right. And if you still don't have, like you said, these boundaries or perfectionism, it it's not gonna be helpful. You're right. still gonna have that chronic pain and, you know, fatigue. Because you're you're draining your cup of tea, you know. Yes, absolutely. And and it, it becomes it becomes this problem to fix, right? So when, okay, I'm going to get 150 minutes of exercise this week and I'm going to take a gram of omega-3s and I'm going to cut out gluten, it becomes this project and mm -hmm. you're not a project, right? You're not a problem to be fixed. Um, and yes, if you're surrounded with, you know, if you're dealing with stress and in, in other areas, it is going to have an impact on your body, on inflammation. Um, even if you're, you may not be fully aware of it, um, but it's happening. So allowing space, allowing time for rest, um, allowing room for support, letting go, like we were talking about at the very beginning, letting go of perfectionism and people pleasing, it's a process. Um, and so just being patient through that process and, and um, practicing self-compassion is, uh, it can go a long way. Yeah, yeah. And Thank you for your time. We went definitely over our, our our minutes, but how can people work with you? And if they're they're not in your state, California, how can people get help from you, learn about you, get more pointers from you? Yeah. So um, in California, people can work with our team at Pacific Integrative Psychiatry. We have an awesome team of integrative doctors and nurse practitioner and uh, nutritionists, therapists. So um, people in California can work with us. People outside of California, they can do a consultation. We can't actually prescribe treatment. But if you want to just get, if you have a psychiatrist or a doctor you're working with, and you just want to get an opinion on supplements or other things you can do, we can do a consultation um, virtually. Uh, we just can't prescribe the treatment, but um, we can give you recommendations and you can take those back to your doctor. And then for people interested in learning more about sleep, I have a YouTube channel 
at Intra Balance. It's I N T R A Balance. And I teach healthcare practitioners about integrative sleep medicine. Um, but of course, if you're not a healthcare practitioner, you can learn a lot from that channel as well. And then I've got an online course for um, doctors on integrative sleep medicine. And then I have an online holistic sleep reset course for anyone interested in integrative approaches to sleep. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. And you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. You too. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you for listening, Autoimmune Warriors. I want you to be aware of three companies. One, Isla Health. It is helpful for tracking your lifestyle to reduce flares, but it's more than a tracking app. Isla Health uses data to develop a personalized care plan that works for your life. So why not check it out? Number two, Adapt Naturals by Chris Kresser. I'm excited to tell you about BioAvail Multi. It gives you the full spectrum of nutrients so you can thrive, like essential vitamins and phytonutrients. Go to adaptnaturals.com slash des15. And use my code DES15 to get 15% off your order. And the third company is Leap Gear. Check out what they're doing. Until next time, be stronger than autoimmune. Guess who I just connected with, Warriors? Leap Gear. Leap what? Leap Cure. Leap Cure connects patients with clinical trials to make research more equitable and efficient. Listen to their latest clinical trial. If you've been diagnosed with thyroid eye disease and are seeking potential new treatment options, you might be interested in the LIDS clinical trial. If you're 18 and over, have a diagnosis of Graves' disease or Hashimoto's, and are interested in potentially participating in research, you can fill out a short questionnaire at lpcur.com TED. You'll be connected with someone on the team to determine whether it might be a good fit for you. Check your eligibility and learn more at lpcur.com slash TED.